societies were lost as Europe fell into the Dark Ages. Aristotle's Children is Richard Rubinstein's story of their controversial rediscovery in 12th century Spain. He spoke about it recently for about an hour. My name is Zachary Scholz, and on behalf of everyone here at Politics and Prose, I would like to welcome you here this evening. We are lucky to have with us Richard Rubenstein. Uh, Professor Rubenstein teaches conflict resolution and public affairs at George Mason University. He is the author of the highly acclaimed book, When Jesus Became God. We are lucky to have him here today with us to discuss his newest book, Aristotle's Children, which describes the profound impact of the 12th century rediscovery of Aristotle's writings on the way we view nature, society, and God. We're gonna have, he's going to speak for about 30 minutes or so and then take questions following that. If you could for the TV and for, so everybody can hear your questions, make it to the um, audience mic, that'd be fantastic. Please join me in welcoming Richard E. Rubenstein. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be back at Politics and Prose again. I used to live around the corner from this store when it was on the other side of the street, and I love coming back here uh, either as a customer or as a speaker. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about this book, um, leaving some time for questions, although for a professor to speak for th only 30 minutes is a, it will be something of a miracle. Um, and. Um, to begin with, I should say, um, uh, what a surprise writing the book turned out to be for me. Um, I study conflict, in particular religious conflict and conflict resolution. I teach at George Mason University at the Institute for Conflict Analysis and Resolution, where we do that sort of thing. And I really had expected when I began this study uh, of religious conflict in the Middle Ages, that I was probably going to run into something very much like uh, Galileo versus the Inquisition, you know, the ortext of uh, modern relations between science and religion. Science goes one way, religion goes the other, never the twain shall meet. Um, I was prepared to discover relations of hostility. What I did discover instead, beginning with this indeed almost miraculous discovery of Aristotle's works in the 12th century by Christians in Spain was a relationship between people of faith and people of reason, um, the same people being very often both people of faith and people of reason. That, that was much more complicated and interesting than I had expected. It was not Galileo versus the Inquisition. It was something much more like a tense, creative dialogue, although dialogue seems a weak word to describe the ferocious kinds of debates that took place in Europe in the century and a half after the discovery of Aristotle's work. Nevertheless, there was a kind of openness, a kind of willingness to entertain possibilities, a willingness to listen to people whom one was convinced was wrong, were wrong, that astonished me. Um, that's uh, the happy side, if you like, of this story. The sad side, which I'll come to at the end, is kind of what became of us after all this. Why we, we don't do this anymore. Um, one way to start, I suppose, is to remind you of the story that I'm sure you heard, as I did as a child, um, of how Columbus um, on his way to discovering uh, whatever he, it was he was going to discover, he discovered also that the, that the world was round, uh, that the world was spherical. Um, Columbus is pictured always to us not only as a physical explorer but also as a scientist, a man of reason, who, contrary to the prevailing opinion in the Middle Ages that the Earth was flat or that you'd sail off to, you know, the end of it if you sailed too far, uh, when, uh, found out made a bet, made a, had a hypothesis, made a bet, got Isabella and Ferdinand to back it, um, and um, discovered that the Earth was spherical. Now, here's uh, somebody else writing about the sphericity of the Earth. Quote, the evidence of the senses further corroborates the sphericity of the Earth. How else would eclipses of the moon show segments shaped as we see them? As it is, the shapes which the moon itself each month shows are of every kind, 
But in eclipses, the outline is always curved. And since it's the interposition of the Earth that makes the eclipse, the form of this line will be caused by the form of the Earth's surface, which is therefore spherical. Hence, one should not be too sure of the incredibility of the view of those who conceive that there is continuity between the parts about the pillars of Hercules, that's the Straits of Gibraltar, and the parts about India, and that in this way the ocean is one. Uh, that's Aristotle writing 1,800 years before Columbus left from Cadiz. But it's not just that he knew something 1,800 years before, it's that everybody did. All educated people in the Middle Ages which, of course, are mainly church people, uh, understood, had read Aristotle by the time Columbus left. And not only that, uh, this, uh, this particular uh, passage from Aristotle was commented on by a scholastic named Pierre Dailly, uh, whose book was found in Columbus's library. So we know that Columbus knew, about, <laughs> knew directly about this. In fact, everybody knew about it. Ed all educated people knew about it. Nobody thought that the Earth was flat. And which raises the question that I'll only just raise now for a moment and then try to come back to, uh, at the end of the talk to it. Why? Why do we continue to foster the myth of medieval ignorance? Why do we continue to date Europe's scientific revolution from the time of Columbus and onward, particularly the 17th century? Um, why do we talk about modernity, including a scientific attitude towards nature, as beginning with Copernicus and Galileo and Newton and so forth, instead of in the scholastic universities of Europe, where scientists were, among other things, discovering the mean speed theorem, the theory of impetus, the rotation of the Earth, and, and so forth. Why isn't the Aristotelian revolution and the enormous effect that it had on learning in Europe part of our cultural story? Why is there this blank, if, if I may use that word, except for specialists? Specialists know all about this, but we don't, most of us, know all about it. So I'll come back to that question in a minute. Um, can you imagine what, what it must have been like to find the Aristotelian works in 12th century Spain? Here was Europe just beginning to recover after that long period of social chaos, you know, poverty, invasions, and so forth that people call the Dark Ages. Uh, a country where, a, a, a part of the world where uh, people didn't practice medicine, they cast spells. People didn't ha have any scientific basis on which to navigate. You know, they, uh, it was all trial and error. Uh, where most learning was still taking place in monasteries only. An awakening was starting in Europe, and if it hadn't started, the rediscovery of the Aristotelian work might not have had anything like the effect that it had, a kind of slingshot effect on European intellectual development. But here are the Christians going into Spain in the 12th century, taking this highly advanced culture, this Muslim culture, in which Jews also played a very important part, back for Christendom, and they begin to hear rumors. The Arabs have amazing works of literature. The Arabs have treasures that Europeans have only talked about in whispers and legendary books like Talmi's Almagest, the, the key to astronomy, like Galen and Hippocrates medical books, like works of Aristotle, not the philosopher that you may, th you may think of Aristotle simply as a philosopher, but Aristotle, the philosopher, the metaphysician, yes, but also Aristotle, the biologist, Aristotle, the physicist, Aristotle, the political scientist, Aristotle, the aesthetic theorist. He wrote on everything, including many subjects that we consider hard science. The material had been lost to Europe for a thousand years, almost. The only thing that the Europeans had of Aristotle's work were the, was the Organon, the six books of logic which had been translated by a heroic fellow who I talk about in the second chapter of the book called Boethius uh, in, the six, uh, in the 600s. After that, nothing. And so all of a sudden, here is this remarkable find. Probably, not probably, I think certainly, the most important intellectual discovery in Western history, perhaps in world history. It's as if, you know, uh, it's not ancient wisdom that was being discovered. It's not 
old documents that tell you how, this is right, this is wrong, this is a good way to die, this is a good way to live. Um, but material that was also the key to the future, as well as a sign from the past. It was almost like, it's almost as if we were to discover in some cave or some or someplace ancient documents containing a cure for AIDS or the key to time travel. And that's the kind of impact that it had on the European mentality uh, at the time that it was discovered. I, I, I write here, it's hard not to think of 12th century Spain as a scholar's paradise. The picture that comes to mind is that of a broad table well lit by candles on which are spread out dozens of manuscripts written in Syriac, Aramaic, Arabic, Hebrew, and Greek. Around the table, poring over the manuscripts, taking notes, or conversing animatedly, are bearded Jews, tonsured Christian monks, turbaned Muslims, and dark-haired Greeks. The setting is Toledo, a Spanish city long ruled by Islamic authorities, but now under Christian control. The table occupies the center of a hall in the city's cathedral, whose archbishop, Raymond I, stands to one side, benevolently watching the polyglot scholars at their work. In his own hands, he holds a book written in Latin, apparently a Catholic missal or one of St. Augustine's works. But close examination reveals its distinctly non-Christian authorship. The book that the archbishop holds so carefully, as if he were afraid it might once again disappear, is a new translation of De Anima, Aristotle's lost book on the soul. That's a, just an, an attempt to imagine what it might have felt like to hold this book in your hands for the first time in a, in a thousand years. A book, by the way, that raises the question, if, as Aristotle says, form and matter, spirit, if you like, and matter, are fused in nature and in the universe, if the world is not divided, as Plato had thought, into a realm of the spirit and a realm of the senses, but rather, if the universe is really a universe, as Aristotle believed, um, how can the soul, how can the body die and the soul live? Aristotle wrestles with that question. Aristotle, who, by the way, believed that the soul was immortal, too, wrestles with this question in De Anima. And the question was to kick off one of the most uh, ferocious debates in the, at the University of Paris, uh, in the 1260s and 1270s, a debate involving St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Bonaventure, Sigurd de Brabant, and other heavy hitters of the period. Having found this material, the, the question was what to do with it, because it was not found written in Greek, uh, certainly not in Latin. The Europeans had mostly even forgotten their Greek, but it was found in Arabic. It was written in Arabic because after a process which I describe early in the book, in which philosophers were basically driven out of the Christian Roman Empire in the 5th century, they, they fled east as refugees, carrying the precious works of Greek science, and arrived in Mesopotamia, the great universities of Mesopotamia and Persia, where they translated the works into Syriac and then into Persian. And then when the Arab conquest took place and the Arabs swept through the area out of Arabia, they asked, they recognized the value of what was laying in these libraries and asked a number of groups, including the Nestorian Christians who had been driven out of the Eastern Empire as heretics, um, to translate the materials into Arabic. And these great linguists translated into Arabic. Now the question was how to get it back into Latin. And You'll, uh, you'll have to read about it if you want to learn the details, but um, in roughly, um, art, men like Archbishop Raymond convened multicultural teams of scholars to translate this stuff from Arabic into Latin. In one case, a, a deacon of the a cathedral at Toledo who was working with a Jewish scholar, the deacon was probably a Mozarab, who, uh, one of the uh, Christians who had been allowed to practice their religion under the rel relatively tolerant regime of the, of the Muslims. Uh, the Christian and brought the Jew into the picture. The Jew translated uh, the material from Arabic into Hebrew and then from Hebrew into Castilian. The Christian translated from Castilian into Latin. 
And that's how the original Aristotelian material landed in Europe as a result of translations done during a period of remarkable openness uh, and interaction, cultural interaction, in the south of Europe, in, particularly in Spain, Provence, and Sicily. Now here's the material. What happens? Well, it's kind of hard to describe because what happens, first one thing happens and then another. For the first period of time, the, the Christian scholars have their hands full simply uh, translating and reading the material. Because the material, it wasn't just the ancient Aristotelian stuff that they got, but Aristotle plus commentaries on Aristotle by the great Arab and Jewish philosophers, by people like Avicenna, Ibn Sina, <laughs> Ibn Rushd, who was called Averroes in Latin, and uh, Moses Maimonides, and others. It was, you know, this is not just like discovering the works of some ancient Einstein, it's like discovering the works of Einstein with commentaries by Niel Bohr and, Einstein, and, and, and the modern Einstein. There was a lot of material to absorb. And it, what, an important factor here is that the Arabs and Jews, who were also monotheists, had already taken this pagan material and tried to deal with it, tried to make it comprehensible and acceptable in some ways from, the, from a monotheist point of view. It was not an easy task. It was not an easy task because if you look at Aristotle uh, today or any time, you see uh, clearly a pagan philosopher. Right? You see a... a one of the great geniuses of all time, of course, but somebody who believed that the universe was eternal, that it had always existed and always would exist. It wasn't created. Because it wasn't created, there was no other place, there was no other realm that Aristotle would have reference to, no heaven. Easier for Plato or for a Platonist to imagine, to, to make their, his, or her, his or her views harmonize with that of the tr traditional Christianity. But very difficult for Aristotle, who says, no, there's no other universe. This is all there is. What you see is what you get. Uh, not only that, the universe is unitary, comprehensible, and beautiful. Reason is not fallen, in Aristotle's view. People have reason, which he considers also a divine gift, uh, but which they can use to actually understand how the universe works. And so there is, in connection with this, a pride in humanity, a, an optimistic view of people's capacity to reason, to think, to understand, and also to be good, to master their passions, to build better societies. And I mean, what is Aristotle's politics other than a kind of social engineering tract, uh, how, how to make a better, a more just society. He defines politics as a branch of ethics. And he says, the, here, here are some ideas about how to have a more just society. You can imagine how, how much of this, including the idea that nature is autonomous. I mean, Aristotle's basic view of, 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 of universal development is that everything in the universe develops according to laws inherent in itself according to the laws of its being. Everything changes, everything is patterned, everything is in the process of development. If that's true, who needs God? What's the role of God? Certainly not an intervener in nature, an intervener in history. In fact, Aristotle has a God, but Aristotle's God is the unmoved mover, who is kind of an intellectual engine for this universe, but who's a part of the universe, not outside the universe. So this material contains lots of ideas that are, one would think would be dangerous, that the Muslims recognized were very dangerous, and because of that recognition, had already, by the time the Aristotelian material was discovered in the West, the Mus Muslims had begun a movement to, towards the marginalization of their philosophers. They had taken the view that, the, this philo that Aristotelian science and the, the science of other Greek uh, philosophers might be useful in their own social development. They would use it where they could, but they would keep it away from the mosque. It would not revolutionize thinking a, a, at the top in terms of theological thinking. It would not revolutionize thinking 
at the bottom because the people, the common people, would be kept away from it. The philosophers could deal with it themselves. That was it. So whether that actually, as some people have speculated, caused a decline in Muslim civilization, a kind of intellectual decline, I don't know. I, d I doubt it, but some people have said so. At any rate, this is a parting of the ways kind of between, in hindsight, one sees a parting of the ways between Muslim civilization and Christian civilization. The Christians are in the odd position, this odd position, that they are the less developed society. They're very much in the position of third world societies vis-a-vis -vis us right now. They have the inestimable advantage that unlike third, third world societies now, who we and others are telling what to do, what to buy, what to think, what kind of government to have, and so forth, the Europeans were free to make their own decisions. There was no imperialism pressing on them in any way, shape, or form. And because of that, that may be one reason why they felt able to cope with, well, I want to come back to this in a minute, they felt able to cope with this new material containing many ideas that were, on the face of it, uh, terrifically dangerous. In the 12th century, the first people to use the Aristotelian material got into a lot of trouble and horrified the church. One was Peter Abelard. I take the liberty in the book of imagining myself a student in one of his classes, the, the great champion of reason in the 12th century. Uh, what a guy. Um, Abelard did not even use the new Aristotelian material, the so-called nature books, the Libros Naturales. He used the old material, the logical material, in order to build arguments that challenged many traditional Christian beliefs although always in the name of Orthodox Christian belief. One thing you realize when you read about these debates, both in the 12th century and the 13th century, is that there are no fundamentalists. Nobody's saying the Bible says it's so, therefore it's so, you know, we don't believe in interpretation. Everybody believes in interpretation. And also there are no atheists. Uh, everybody acknowledges this, a, a supreme being and makes a bow in the direction of Christian theology. More than a bow. Tries to accommodate uh, his or her views to the essentials of Christian orthodoxy. Nevertheless, there is a, a very large area for maneuver, very large area for debate, which this leaves. Abelard gets into trouble in ways that are described here, and I won't give away the ending of that story, with St. Bernard of Clairvaux, and ends, uh, his career ends um, tragically um, after he uh, takes a position on the Trinity, which he believes is uh, acceptable according to Aristotelian logic, but which is not acceptable according to Christian orthodoxy. One of his associates, a man named Berengar of Tours, just to illustrate how this worked, uh, looked at the Eucharist from the Aristotelian point of view and said, well, Aristotle teaches us that there can't be substance without accidents. There can't be a a substance, the Aristotle believed the whole universe was made up of substances, not atoms as, as we do, but substance. And each substance had properties, and you, you, you couldn't have properties hanging in space. If you had the properties, you have to, ought to also had to have the substance. That's what empirical observation and logic tell you. So, Berengar of Tours said, if the bread is presented in the Eucharist, and the priest says, this is the body, it's the body of Christ. There's no question that it is the body of Christ because everybody believes that, everybody accepted that. Mm -hmm. But the question that these inquiring people of the 12th century and the 13th century wanted to know is, how does that happen? What's really going on here? There is, in fact, a kind of lust to understand. It's, there are two great movements going on in this period, a movement of popular piety, where people are trying to live cleaner, better, more intensely religious lives, and they're trying en masse. And a movement just as intense to understand, to want to make sense of things, to want to reconcile faith with reason, to use Boethius' term, to know what's going on. So Berengar of Tours says, well, if you can't have a properties or accidents in the Aristotelian language without a substance, that means that the bread is still the bread. If it's the body, too, okay, we'll, we, we, we all believe that and we'll accept that. 
but it's also the bread. So this is a theory of consubstantiation. It's not transubstantiation, which became the orthodoxy, but consubstantiation. There was a period in which this, this sort of thing was openly debated. Berengar was finally told, no, you're wrong, and he retracted the theory of um, uh, consubstantiation. But the fact that the debate could be held in the form that it was, the, de fact, the, the, the fact that there was this intense longing to understand, makes what happened next more understandable. Toward the end of the 12th century, some flat-out pantheists got hold of the Aristotelian material and started teaching at universities outside Paris. The University of Paris was just created in 1200. This was slightly before, right around the same time at Corbeil. Uh, two stone pantheists began teaching that what Aristotle had said was that God was in the world, God was the world, you couldn't distinguish between the world and God, it was classical pantheism. Uh, one disappears from history after that, we don't know what happened to him, the other who had already died was dug up and burned. Uh, and ten of his followers were either burned to death or imprisoned for life, depending on, on who you read. This was not a tolerant age. If you cross that line, and the line separating pantheism from Orthodox Judaism, must Islam, or Christianity, was fairly clear. So in 1210, the Bishop of Paris decided this stuff is too hot to handle for the students coming into the University of Paris at the age of 13, 12, 13, 14, which is when the students began their university education in Europe. Because of the awakening that was taking place, new universities are springing up all over Europe, Paris, Oxford. After the big strike at Paris, more universities, Lyon. After the big strike at Oxford, the students were always striking. Cambridge was uh, created. Padua was created after a strike at Bologna. And so, the, in this very turbulent and inquiring atmosphere with young people coming from all over Europe, the first reaction of the church is, this is going to poison minds, this is going to confuse people. Uh, we, we can't let this happen. And then, the fascinating story is, it happened anyway. The material was banned at the University of Paris. When the Paris students went on strike, ads, which we've, I've seen copies of, from uh, a neighboring university uh, in France said, come to our school, here you can read the works that were banned in Paris. <laughs> People had to know. They couldn't be stopped from reading. But something else happened, too, that unlocked the gates, that made the Aristotelian river a flood uh, that swept over the university so that by the 12th, 50s, this material was required reading at all un European universities. It had gone from being banned to being required reading. One of the things that happened was that the Catholics were engaged in fierce debates with a number of heretical groups, the most significant of which in its numbers and in its moral and intellectual appeal were the group that we call the Cathars in southern France a group of very large group, they basically, they, at one point it looked like they were in control of southern France, who have combined dualistic beliefs, belief in a good God and an evil God and an eternal struggle between the good and the evil God, with very pure behavior on the part of their clergy, which made the Catholic clergy of the time look bad, and with an open challenge to papal authority, with a challenge that said, we are the true church, the Catholic church is not. It's a, the Catholic church is a pack of lies. They eventually got themselves exterminated. The Pope Innocent preached a, an internal crusade against them uh, to eliminate them. But even before they, that, that happened, the Catholics had come to the conclusion that they were not very well equipped to take on these Cathars in debate. Because, among other things, the Cathars had gotten hold of the Aristotelian materials and were using them to bolster their arguments. So the first, the, the first Dominican, Dominic himself, Dominic de Guzman, went to the Pope and said, we need to use Aristotle against the Cathars. These guys are dualists. They think the world's divided into bad matter and good spirit. Aristotle's got the answer to that. The world is unitary, and matter can't be bad. It's because, among other things, it's combined with spirit, with form. Um, other arguments of this sort convinced the church that Aristotle could be extremely useful to them and 
something else is going on here. I'm not sure I even understand it entirely. But men, leaders like Innocent, are the kind of conservatives that are all too rare, I must say, today. People with a long, long historical view, realizing that if the church wanted to keep its position as the primary arbiter, moral arbiter, primary mediator, primary intellectual force and cultural force in Europe, it would have to come to terms with this new learning and with the awakening that was, um, with which it was connected. Um, so Innocent, who is also the man who brought Francis into the church, who said, if we can't, if we keep the popular piety outside the church, we're in trouble. The, the great nightmare, of course, which eventually became a reality for them, was that a movement of popular piety would find an intellectual, a movement among the intelligentsia to unite with and with the secular authorities and it cause a real schism in the church. Innocent, kind of seeing down that long path, says, well, we're going to crush the Cathars because they're, you know, they've set, up, they've set themselves up as a counter church. But as far as the movement is popular piety is concerned, we're going to bring them inside as long as they play by cer certain rules. And he brings Francis inside. And as far as the intellectuals are concerned, we don't want them running off to work for the secular princes or somebody. We're going to keep them inside too by coping with the Aristotelian material. How the coping took place is the story of the rest of the book. Um, Three parties basically were formed that fought it out from the 1240s into the 1270s and even beyond. Conservative Aristotelians led by St. Bonaventure and the Franciscans, John Peckham. Liberal Aristotelians led by Thomas Aquinas. And radical Aristotelians led by a fellow named Sigurd de Brabant, uh, a master of arts in the university who caused a riot in the university in every sense of the word um, in the 1270s by preaching uh, doctrines that he had derived from the Arab Aristotelians that horrified the, uh, some of the Christian authorities. This creative, tense, turbulent debate took place without anybody getting burned, without anybody getting hurt, with a few people losing their jobs, yes. But for the most part, in an atmosphere that was not, uh, shall I say, peaceful and happy, it was stormy, but an atmosphere that was tolerant in the sense that it allowed the debate to go on within the scholastic, within the terms of scholastic debate. Meaning, you state your argument, you anticipate and state the best possible arguments of the other side, you give your counter argument, you anticipate the opponent's counter-arguments, you come to some conclusion. Um, so productive was this method that by the end of the period that I write about, it was producing what I call, and I think is an accurate, this is an accurate way to put it, Europe's first scientific revolution. Europe had a scientific revolution before the movement that we call the scientific revolution. and. So let me return in the last minute of this uh, talk to the question that I started with. Why isn't this better known among us? Why don't we know this story? Why isn't this, an, which is an exciting story, why isn't it part of our, our own cultural heritage? And I have to say, I speculate, frankly, at the end of the book about this. And here's what I think. I mean, I think one reason is cultural chauvinism. I think every culture likes to imagine that its fundamental sources are self-created, are, are uh, autonomous. Nobody likes to say, we borrowed, we got this from someplace else. And this was a case of a borrowing as massive, at least, as the kind of borrowing that e the East is doing from the West right now when they borrow techno technological knowledge and so forth. In some ways, it's more profound. A borrowing, and not was not, it wasn't it wasn't only a borrowing from the other in any kind of abstract way. It was a, it was a borrowing from the traditional enemies of Christian of Christian Latin Christian Europe, the Muslims and the Jews. That one possible reason. Second possible reason um, why we have this gap is perhaps anti-Catholic prejudice. 
or a kind of image of the church derived from the Galileo versus Inquisition story, which we're kind of comfortable with in modern periods because making the Catholics bad makes the Protestants look good. Making the feudal political system look bad makes the modern state look good. Making Catholic doctrines of the just price and all of that look bad makes capitalism look good. I put, I put question marks at the end of all that. I'm not asserting it. I'm saying hmm, maybe. There's maybe some reason we don't want to recognize that the church one, once played for all its contradictions and all its brutality during, and it was plenty brutal to non-Christians during the period, uh, it played a progressive role. Third reason, though, which is related to that, which seems to be most, to me, most convincing, is that this period of creative dialogue between faith principles and reason principles, between science and religion, acts as a, a kind of expose of the modern dilemma. Reading it, it will make you uncomfortable, I think, with where we ended up. Because what these people were struggling to do was to try to prevent a split between rational thought and religious thought, a split between science and ethics, a split between faith and reason. Let me read something to you that will give you this idea. So, the, I mean, and the, the punchline of this is when we see ourselves today, we see our privatized religion. Religion is a matter, a private matter between a person or a people and their God. And it's not it's supposed to be not really, in, not a public matter, a private matter. But it won't stay private. It's an unstable, that wall of separation is an unstable wall. It's a porous wall. It, the religious matters won't stay private, especially when they're mixed with, when they're, in, when, when they're involved intensely held and fundamental beliefs. And that's true whether the belief that we're talking about is abortion or the just war. Right? It's easy enough for me, who I'm kind of a liberal in my politics for the, most of the time, to say, oh, uh, you know, the, the anti-abortion forces are operating out of you know, religious, uh, over, overzealous religious attitude. But then ask me about Iraq, what I think about Iraq. And some other people may say he's acting out of overzealous ethical, religious attitude. Um, so I write here, um, since the privatized religions won't stay private, and since public dis discourse also, which is supposed to be predominantly scientific, really isn't, is infiltrated by ethics and can't wall itself off either no matter how much people may try to appeal to allegedly ob objective and value-free scientific reasons for doing what they want to do, we have contradictions that are painful and embarrassing to confront, especially compared with this period of creative dialogue. So I'll just read this and then I'm finished. The fundamental thrust of the scholastic movement, stimulated by Aristotle's concept of a purposeful universe, was to reconcile faith with reason. Intelligent people committing themselves to certain religious beliefs or ethical values wanted reasons to do so in addition to those mandated by tradition or the command of some charismatic leader. They wanted to know why they should make those commitments rather than others and how those they made were reflected or affirmed by developments in nature and society. At the same time, scholars investigating nature and society wanted to understand the relationship between the facts and patterns they uncovered and the realm of beliefs and values. That is. They needed to be able to evaluate the impact of their discoveries and to determine how they could be used for human betterment. The end of the Aristotelian era left us with these urgent needs unsatisfied. Science, deprived of its connection with religious faith, has become increasingly technical and value-free, in quotes, while religious commitments cut loose from their naturalistic moorings seem increasingly a matter of arbitrary instincts or tastes. Worse yet, with global economic and military power concentrating at an unprecedented rate in the hands of a few powerful elites, both faith and reason tend to become tools in the hands of raw, self-aggrandizing power. Under these circumstances, the partners to this former marriage, turbulent though it was, cannot help dreaming of a possible reconciliation. 
Reason could transform the earth if only science and technology were inspired and guided by a new global morality. Faith would expand and mature if only the world's religions addressed themselves to long-term trends in society and nature and helped to create that global morality. And since the split between faith and reason divides each of us against himself, we could become more loving and useful to each other and more satisfied with ourselves if we could only integrate these fundamental aspects of our being. Integrate, not fuse, for it's the creative tension between faith and reason that we dream of restoring, not some false identity. Just as the shattering of the Aristotelian consensus radically changed both science and religion, so in the forging of a new postmodern consensus, they will surely change once again. These changes will be difficult as they always have been, but a world hungry for wholeness yearns for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's talk. Yes, sir. Uh, I understand that Byzantium had an 1,100-year history, uh, starting in the 300s. Why has it been so thorough, thoroughly ignored by scholars uh, studying the period between 300 and 14? Well, you know, I don't know. I think there is a new interest in Byzantium. There is some, there's some new material that's been coming out just this year and last year on Byzantium. Byzantium, the question was why, did you hear, it? the question was why has the, the Byzantine Empire also been ignored for so long? It was a long period of rule by Greek-speaking Christians. Um, so, and I don't really know the answer. Um, I know there is some in interest in it now. And I know I, 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 I talked to a um, Greek Orthodox priest at a dialogue session, that uh, a little conference that we were doing at my institute uh, on the question of religion and proselytization, why proselytizing evangelism causes conflicts. And um, this Greek Orthodox priest told me about an experience that he had had going to um, Constantinople, now Istanbul, um, and being pointed to um, on the street, being called on the street, a Frank. A Frank, a Frank, you're a Frank. One of the things that the Greeks remember very well is the sack of Constantinople by the Latin Knights in the Fourth Crusade in 1204. They haven't forgotten it. It's what Vamek Volkan at the University of Virginia calls a chosen trauma. Um, they really have not forgotten about it. It was a vicious sack. It was mass massacres. The city was looted, and it was put under the under Latin power for the lasted, I think, about 50 years or maybe 100 even before the Latins were kicked out. So there's been a lot of bad blood between Latin and Greek Christians. Much and while uh, while some some um, work is being done to reconcile them now theologically and so forth. There's still culturally a lot, a lot of bad blood. So maybe that, I, it's a good question. I'm sorry, I can't answer it better. Yeah. Um, how many people were involved in all this highfalutin thinking and whatnot about Aristotle and, um, and the world in general uh, as, say, a percentage of the population at, as a whole? Uh, and did it have any effect at the time? I mean, the um, Europe was in turmoil then, and, and not only was it in turmoil, I don't think many of the people in charge um, were intellectually substantive folks. I don't think the kings of England, for instance, in the 12th and 13th century were particularly literate. I don't know if those ideas would get there. Now, where did they go? I mean, uh, That's a good question. The question is, where, the question is uh, how many people really knew about the Aristotle? How many people participated in the debates over Aristotle or knew about them? The answer is difficult, but um, I'll give you the broad outline. Not many. I mean, in answer, uh, we are still talking about an age in which to be literate is to, is to make you a part of a small intellectual elite. Um, with, with some, uh, with some uh, I have to also qualify that a bit. There are estimates that the church, that people in orders of one kind or another, and all of the people at the universities are in, one, are in minor orders, if not major orders. 
um, that counting all of the church people in orders and church employees, they probably amounted to around 10% of the entire European population. So, and this is a very large group. It's one reason why the continual efforts by the popes to reform them, you know, to clean up the clergy and so forth, uh, continually failed, was that they were dealing with so many people, so many people of so many different kinds, so many different kinds of people. Um, so among people who were literate, among people who were involved at the universities, um, there was, of course, intense interest in Aristotle. How much of that filtered down? We don't know. We know that, for example, the Bishop of Paris, Robert, Robert de Corson, in one of, the, one of his vain attempts to continue the ban on Aristotle's work, he has a specific command saying, to, in which he says to the scholars, don't discuss scientific matters with the common people. Now, the whole thing is kind of a joke because, I mean, if the material was banned, they shouldn't have even been discussing it among themselves. So it's also, it's also a recognition that the ban wasn't working. But they did not want to confuse the common folk or to get the common folk in an uproar. But listen, here's what's happening among common folk, okay? Here's Henry the Monk. This is in the 1100s, late 1100s. No, I'm sorry, mid-1100s. At the same time that Abelard was gaining notoriety in Paris, Henry appeared at the gates of Le Mans, uh, before the car race, you know, or something, carrying, this is quote, carrying a cross on an iron-tipped staff, bearded, barefoot, and with poor clothing. That's how what he looked like. In almost no time, extraordinary things began to occur in that city. Henry transfixed the townspeople with his denunciations of corrupt, property-hungry bishops and priests. He preached against luxury, linked simplicity with salvation, and urged his listeners to make bonfires of their fancy clothes and ornaments. Most passionately, he condemned the new onerous rules that forbade marriages between distant cousins and that made marriage a sacrament of the church to be controlled and taxed by the priesthood. Love, he said, the consent of the persons alone sanctified marriage. And Christian love could save even the unchaste from hellfire and damnation. On one memorable Sunday, Henry called the prostitutes of Le Mans to the town square, where, in accordance with his instructions, they stripped off their fancy clothes and cut their hair. Then he had them cast these symbols of their former lives into the fire. They put on new clothes purchased for them by generous townspeople, and respectable young men recruited in advance stepped forward to marry them. So... What I point out in this, in this subsequently in this same chapter is that this movement of popular piety kind of slopped over naturally into a challenge which was intellectual to certain church doctrines. For example, there's no evidence that Henry the Monk ever met Abelard or even knew of him, but he shared the conviction that a willing intention, what Abelard called consent, was necessary to give acts ethical meaning. If this were so, could sprinkling holy water on a squalling infant have the saving effect claimed for it by the traditionalists? And what was one to think about the Eucharist? Could the miraculous transubstantiation of the bread and wine be the result of a few magic words spoken by an indifferent or corrupt priest? At that point, you have a challenge which is called donatism, which Catholics, Catholic theologians will recognize that as a donatist heresy, that it's the holiness of the priest, not the role of the, not the office of the priest that makes the the acts, the, you know, the acts effective. But the point I'm trying to make is that you can't, you couldn't really wall things off into kind of the common people stupidly, you know, or the common people simply motivated by piety, the intellectuals motivated by reason. In fact, what made this such a dangerous situation for the church and what makes the way they dealt with it fairly heroic, I think, um, is that the common people were, start, were thinking for themselves, too. They might not have the education. They would not talk, they would not debate, probably, the nature of, you know, the soul in the way that Thomas Sigurd de Brabant and Bonaventure debated the nature of the soul with, with quotations from Aristotle's metaphysics and all the rest. But they would debate the, the sorts of issues that I just mentioned. Um, and so there are link, you see links between popular thinking and the thinking of the elite. I, I suppose you might say that one of the goals of the church in this period was to prevent the thinking of the elite from having a revolutionary effect among the popular people, among the, in the popular, among the populace. 
uh, a, a, something that they've successfully managed for the next 400 years. Yeah. Yes. I was wondering, uh, presumably Aristotle wrote in Greek, and in what century would his works have been translated into Arabic? And, and I presume that the Roman Empire completely bypassed his work, but was not aware of it. Oh, no, no. I mean, Aristotle was, you know, it's kind of hard to get a sense... You tend to look at backwards always and have look at things from your modern perspective. And Plato and Aristotle are so big to us, so enormous to us. Um, they were recognized in their own time as being major philosophers. But I think it, they were recognized in their own time as being among the best philosophers. There were others also, you know, being recognized. In the, I mean, the, the, the history of our, you don't want me to go into detail on this, I don't think, but the history of, Aristotle's work after it was, after Aristotle, um, after Aristotle's death, um, uh, his own life is, it makes a real interesting story, which I tell in brief, you know, in the first chapter. But after his death, his works are lost for a time, and there's a kind of legend about them that his nephew put them in a, hid them in a cave to keep them away from the Romans who were marauding at that point through Greece. And, um, you know, the kind of Roman, barbaric Romans. Um, later on, a Roman scholar named Andronicus gets hold of the com what we now consider the complete works of Aristotle, which probably represents about a, a third of his total output. This two thirds of his worth is lo work is lost, period. Um, so he gets a whole, and, and by the way, what we have of Aristotle, it's kind of hard to read, you know, I mean, it's sort of boring to read his style. The poet Thomas Gray uh, compared it with eating hay. <laughs> um, because what we seem to have is lecture notes. Um, his lecture notes, or a write-up of his lectures by somebody. But he's praised in some of the classical sources for his elegant style. And there's nothing that he's, apparently he wrote very elegantly, but we don't know that. You know, we don't have that. So. Uh, so, th anyway, the work is lost, then it's found by Andronicus, it's published, it becomes uh, the subject, I mean, there's an Ar Aristotelian movement, the Lyceum, the, the institution that he created as an alternative to Plato's Academy, goes on t until at least the third century, uh, you know, B uh, A.D. Um, and then the stuff disappears, but then again, so does the rest of, so does Plato. And the Emperor Justinian closes the academy in Athens um, in the 500s because he's convinced that this philosophy is dangerous to Christianity, Christian, the purity of Christian thought. That's the period I described in the second chapter in which the Christians turn away from philosophy and the philosophers, I said before, go east, you know, in the same way that a later generation of refugees went west when, uh, under similar circumstances from Europe. Um, the fascinating thing about this is, and then, then there's, a, it's a, there's a long time before this stuff is found again. Fascinating thing about it is that there's something almost mythical about it. It's lost and found. It's, it, you know, it disappears from view, and then it's rediscovered. Um, so you could hypothesize about it. I, I do here um, that there are some ages that may be more attuned to Platonic thinking or to no philosophy at all. Um, particularly ages when survival itself is a, is a, a major accomplishment. And when um, people turn away from this world and start to look for consolation in somewhere else, in another world. Uh, people turn away from organized society and start to, uh, en masse, and start to form little societies or to, and to also to worry about their own sinfulness or not. Um, at, the, at such times you find, uh, as uh, uh, in particularly beginning with St. Augustine, the, you know, the greatest of the Christian Platonists, um, you find a, a tendency towards Platonic thought, Ar and Arist Aristotle's materials sort of disappear in those materials. Aristotle gets rediscovered when, when uh, society comes alive again, in the sense that Aristotle gets rediscovered when people begin to take pride in their reason. And when, um, to be more uh, historical about it, when population is growing, towns are morphing into cities, 
trade and agriculture are increasing. The climate is changing, which even happened in Europe during the period of the European awakening, so as to make agriculture more productive. Um, people begin to look abroad, and people begin to think even imperialist thoughts, you know. I don't think it's any action that Aristotle's buddy was uh, Alexander the Great. That is to say, uh, people, with this, this pride in reason and this emphasis on the universality of reason also may remind you of the Romans. Yeah. Yes, um, I think the Jews in ancient times, for example, in Hellenistic Egypt, attempt to reconcile Aristotelian philosophy with uh, Jewish monotheism. And if so, did these written attempts survive to medieval times? And could they be looked at as well? Yes, they sure can. There is there's some good scholarly works on it. question was, did the Jews also try to reconcile Aristotelianism with Judaism? And the answer is yes. There, there were... The answer is yes, and then the answer is no. The, the, here's the yes part. The yes part is that there were great Jewish philosophers, all of, most of them writing in Arabic, um, who were part of the Arab empire, or empires, I guess I should say. Uh, Ibn Gabirol, who the Latins knew as Avicebron, was a kind of Platonizing Aristotelian, very much like Avicenna. Um, Moses Maimonides, the greatest of the Jewish Aristotelians, was. I mean, maybe it's not generally known that he was an Aristotelian, but he was a. He was an. He was profoundly influenced by Aristotle, to the point that he got himself in trouble with Orthodox Jewry. Um, in his Guide to the Perplexed, in which he used certain Aristotelian concepts in ways that the Orthodox didn't like at all. Um, but as the Arab empire gradually moved in a different direction, a more, shall I say, mystical direction, less scientific, to use the you know, gross terms. Um, most of the Jews who were part of that empire also went in the same direction. Um, and even did in Europe, well, I mean, the low point of this for the Jews, I think, was when a group of rabbis in Provence turned Moses Maimonides' Guide to the Perplexed over to the Inquisition so that it could be burned. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Well, Philo, uh, who's a subject you may know of this of a wonderful work by Wolfson, by Harry Wolfson. Uh, Wolfson became such an expert on Philo that after a while nobody knew how much was Wolfson and how much was Philo. And so, you know, Philo of Alexandria, you know, also knew about Aristotle, but him, he himself was more, it was influenced by other philosophies as well, especially Neoplatonism. Yeah. When, I, I may say this incorrectly, but you use the word rediscover, yet at the time of the Dark Ages, really the Arab world, as I understand, was really much more advanced than was the West. Are you implying, in effect, that the Arab world basically had most of this knowledge and really didn't know how to apply it? are just rediscovered from the standpoint of in the West? No, just rediscovered. When I say rediscovered, I only mean from the standpoint of the West. No, the Arabs had, had this material and had been using it very, you know, to their great advantage. And um, there's no doubt about the quali what the quality of Arab civilization was at the point that this, these discoveries were made. Let me, I'll read you a couple of sentences. <clears throat> Spain's Christian invaders found themselves mixing with well-established, highly cultured Muslim and Jewish communities. I'm writing here. The situation was to have faithful consequences for the future development of European thinking, for behind Christendom's armed knights marched its clergy, at this point Europe's only literate class. And what they found in Spain left them astonished and perplexed. Not only were cities like Toledo and Cordova clean and well-ordered, not only was life softened and beautified by fountains, flowers, music, and an architecture as imaginative as Europe's was stolid, not only did Arabs live at peace with a bewildering assortment of minority communities, but scholarship flourished as in some dream of ancient a Athens or Alexandria. One can only imagine what it must have been like for dazzled Christian churchmen to talk with Muslim and Jewish scholars about philosophical and religious issues that their co-religionists had been exploring with great insight and sophistication for the last 300 years. All right. So then, you know, there is this question of timing. Um, um, 
one of the odd one of the ironies of the situation is that part of the you might you may even see this as what one one scholar Lenin called the advantages of backwardness um, in in the Muslim world both both Islam and Judaism were and st still are in many ways ways of life not so much credos and there was no Muslim Pope uh, Muslim institutions were decentralized. The empire itself was really a collection of empires. Um, there was a lot of agreement among different groups and peoples in the empire, but it was voluntary for the most part. Um, so you might view this all as a sign of an advanced civilization, whereas in Europe, you had this church, you know, this corporation, mobilized from the top down, dominated by a figure, by the Pope in Rome, after a certain time, um, hierarchical, bureaucratic. And the irony is that if that institution turned its back on the new learning, that, that would have been it. But if they didn't, if they adopted it, if they decided to open their minds to the Aristotelian material, European thinking would be revolutionized from the top down. And that's what happened. That's what happened, despite the continual heresy hunting and despite the crusades, the barbaric crusades, and despite, you know, the anti-Semitism and so forth. They opened their minds to the new material and once embedded in European civilization, it could never be undone. You might even say, I mean, I tend to think that the second scientific revolution was inherent in the first. The title, Metaphysics, is, should actually be translated not as that which goes beyond physics, but the book that comes after physics. That's right. Um, and have suggested that the whole science of metaphysics is a misnomer. Do you have any uh, thoughts on the descent of that concept of metaphysics? Sure. Um, one of the things certainly that's happened to metaphysics is that we would never, most people would not consider it a science anymore, since we have divided the knowledge into realms of science and non-science, or science and wisdom, or hard science and soft stuff. I'm really never sure where the work that I do belongs on that spectrum, or where the work any historian does belong. Um, but, uh, you know, but in, insofar as interest in being, I would, you know, I recommend to you a book by Philip Capu Caputo, a philosopher from, you know, I forget where, what his university is, uh, called Aquinas and Heidegger on, on being, which is all, which it starts out from the point, which is mostly about interpretations of Aristotle's metaphysics, first by Aquinas, and then by the early postmodernists, if you want to call Heidegger that, um, like Heidegger. So I mean, I think there's still a lot of interest, um, at least among certain people, in dealing with questions like what is being anyway, all right, and can, is there anything that can we say? Are there any? Are there laws of being? Does it make sense to talk of non-being, etc.? <laughs> I'm not a professional philosopher, and I don't. Well, I don't want to go any further with that. And when I learn something more about it, I'll, I'll tell you. Are there other questions? Okay, well, it's been a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you for your attention. Richard Rubenstein is author of Aristotle's Children. It's published by Harcourt on the web at harcourtbooks.com.